Due diligence laws are coming into fashion. They aim to hold companies more accountable for their products across the entire supply chain. Today, we will look at the agricultural sector and ask, do diligence regulations in supply chains well-intentioned but also a risk for sustainability? I'm Nicholas Martin. Thank you for joining the fifth episode of our podcast, Shaping Sustainable Supply Chains. Many European countries have passed due diligence laws. They are supposed to tackle human rights violations like child labor or poor working conditions along the entire supply chain. The European Union is also working on such a law which will also focus on environmental risks such as deforestation in supply chains. But the new legislations also carry risks. This is what we want to highlight today and we want to focus on the agricultural sector and specifically on smallholder farmers. My guest is Dr. Bettina Rudloff from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, SWP. She specializes in European trade and development issues and she advises stakeholders who negotiate or are affected by trade agreements. So she will bring the bigger picture to our show. Hello, Bettina. Great to have you with us. Hello, Nicolas. Happy to be here. And for the local perspective, we have Dr. Michael Bruntrup with us. He is an agricultural economist and expert on rural development and food security at the German Development Institute, DIE. He has been doing research on the ground for more than 30 years with a focus on West Africa cotton producers. But he's also been researching other smallholder farmers and agricultural workers and their labor conditions. Good to talk to you, Michael. Hello. Germany and other countries have long relied on voluntary corporate due diligence or trade and investment agreements to ensure a level of sustainability in supply chains. But now we are seeing more and more countries adopting national due diligence laws. France, the Netherlands and most recently Germany have all passed such laws. You both told me earlier that you are critical of the moves. So in a few words... Was it a mistake to pass such a legislation in Germany? I think the diagnosis of many serious infringements of human rights law and, of course, also environmental problems is right. Also, the intention of the value chain law is right. We want to have better conditions. But I think a value chain law is not the right instrument. It has more risks and negative consequences. And for this reason, I would in summary say, no, I don't think it's a good idea to establish such laws. What do you think, Bettina? I think especially it's important not to rely, let's say, completely alone on such due diligence acts. It's just one instrument within a huge orchestra, let's say, playing about sustainability development issues. And it's important to see how this arrangement all together fits with each other. Where are the specific strengths and limitations? Where are interlinkages? So to use really best of all these single instruments instead of now relying so much on this new idea, this new measure. So we, we're going to talk about the, the orchestra later on, but let's take a step back, just looking at one instrument, which is the due diligence law. Actually, there are many of them right now in Europe, especially. What do they all have in common, Michael? I will concentrate here on the human rights perspectives of these due diligence uh, laws. And you mentioned already several of the issues which are child labor, for example. There are some people talking about up to 100 million children working under extremely, sometimes extremely bad conditions, and many of them in agriculture, no doubt about that. Another issue is slavery or forced labor. And we have heard in the news, for example, about these issues in China very recently, but also in Uzbekistan and India is a case which is very renowned for bad conditions. Labor unions and free negotiation of labor conditions is another fundamental right. It is one of the ILO, International Labor Organization, core conditions 
And I think finally, the working conditions more in general. And also, sometimes you hear about wages, incomes of laborers and of smallholders are also subject to intended laws. It is not always in the laws, but there are strong intentions and pressures to bring living wages, living incomes into such legislation and make importing enterprises responsible for respecting all these laws throughout the value chain, not only for the first tire companies in the direct delivering countries, but also over many, sometimes six, seven countries and stages down to producers in poor countries. And now there's also another layer coming upon all these due diligence laws that are already have been adopted, which is the European due diligence law. Right, Bettina? Yes, Michael talked about the first tire approach. The European idea is a bit more risk-based. They want to limit it to certain already known specific risk products or risk companies in the value chain. So not for each step before your own company. So you see that are some relevant differences. What is all in common is it's mandatory for the companies. So instead of the now or prior existing voluntary issues, there's a kind of penalty foreseen, which could be really a monetary fine, which could be as well an exclusion from public tendering, for instance. And in the EU, to add upon that, maybe as well, it will be relevant that there should be an European-wide approach. Otherwise, you will end up in intra-European competition, which could be disadvantaged for certain national companies, which could be as well a problem for the consumer. In the end, all these products affected maybe by different legal acts are sold in one and the same European market. And you can't really differentiate that good enough as a consumer. And finally, as well, for the delivery countries, for instance, developing countries facing then a lot of different legal acts, which will end up to larger costs. So it's more or less already a fact that the European law will replace the other national laws or this is still to negotiate? Usually that's the idea. But it will last a bit. The adoption phase is more than one year once the commission started the formal legal decision process. So and in this time in between, there will be these different national initiatives. Michel, you talked at the beginning about the unintended consequences. And Michel, you have good contacts on the ground and you have asked the managing director of the African Cotton Foundation, Belinda Edmonds, for her opinion. Just uh, information, the African Cotton Foundation has the aim, I'm quoting from their homepage, to provide the critical link between smallholder farmers and the market. So let's hear what Belinda Edmonds' fears are. In general terms, based on average yields and acreages, About 1,140 African smallholder farmers produce the equivalent amount of cotton fiber as one commercial farm of 500 hectares. Considering that in some cotton-producing countries, farm size is in excess of 10,000 hectares, the economic implications are clear. Loss of access to these markets would likely result in a steep increase in poverty levels, reduced food production, and a negative impact on the GDP and foreign reserves of several African countries. Michelle, that sounds quite drastic. Why is she so convinced that these economic implications will come true? You told me earlier that you fear so-called leakage effects in particular. Is that what Belinda Edmonds is addressing here? She sees the risks. She is not very sure about it because she also proposes measures to countervail these effects. But yes, there are real points. Let, let us stop a while with child labor, which I think is the very basic risk and problem in cotton farmers. We know that children both from the family farms, but also from other farms, are working particularly during the harvest of cotton. But for smallholder farmers, it's extremely difficult to prove, for example, that these children, they have a sufficient education at school so that the accepted level of child labor, which also exists, that it is not exceeded. 
And that is the risk then that for a German buyer of textiles from Bangladesh, which has traveled the whole world, and finally we know that there are some African cotton farmers behind it who have produced the cotton. It can be 100,000 of smallholder farmers for which you do not know the conditions for the children which are working on these farms. So what would we do, or what would the enterprise do if the risk is important and if there are high fines? You go to a larger farm for which the supervision costs and also the ease of supervising are smaller. So there is a shift from small to medium and large uh, farmers. You would also go to a country where you know that the government supervision and maybe also the typical level of wages is high, high enough for a family to live on. So you would go from a very poor country to a medium income country. You know? To ensure that you're fine with the due diligence, yeah? That you are due diligence, that you don't have to invest too much and that you can be relatively sure that the, the, the risk protocols that you have established are really reproduced on the ground. These are the fears. And a third fear is certainly also that you go, for example, to reduce those works. For example, we have talked here about harvest of cotton. You can mechanize it. So you would also try maybe to substitute capital for labor, which is good for your balance in the human rights conditions. But of course, that doesn't help the poor families who have to make a living out of that. Mm. You, you already touched it. Due diligence regulations have an impact on trade relations. Bettina, what could be the implications if we look at the international trade of agricultural products? The European or the German companies may be They, they feel it to be too risky to make business with certain companies in delivery regions. That is one international possible trade deviation that one is doing business with other delivery regions, which is in the end not sustainable because then there will be no income generated there. There will be no technology transfer. There will be no investments. That's as well not a sustainable development goal, actually. The other type of leakage effect, deviation effect, is very much known from the climate policy area. So that's the other perspective. That's more from the delivering region. So if you can decide what is your export destination? And then you face an export destination which imposes very complicated and in the end expensive requirements on the value chain, you may decide, oh, that's too expensive for us. It's too complicated really to do all these monitoring issues. We actually go for another destination. And that means, okay, the European companies, they are not guilty anymore. They are not responsible for certain kind of sustainable development problems, but they still remain because the country still is doing the problematic things, but for another destination market. And that as well is actually should not be the idea of supporting sustainable development. You have now mentioned some of the risk of these laws, but I mean, we all agree that from a German perspective, and, and you touched it right now, Bettina, the outcome of such a law is that German companies will no longer be significantly involved in human rights violations. So, Michael, putting the question to you, isn't that great news? That's very great news for the German companies and the German producers because he has a good consciousness. He can consume with good consciousness his products. But the state of the world and of the poor farmers is not better. And that is my argument. It is maybe worse. And very often we will not even know about it because we lose these poor farmers who drop out of the value chains or who are not integrated in them because we do not take account of them. We don't monitor it. And that is my complaint is that, yes, for us, it is greenwashing of our value chains, if you want to, but it is not improving the state of the world. But isn't it worth a try? Yes, it is maybe worth a trial. I'm not against it. I think as more formal a value chain is and the more you have fixed relations between the partners, better this, this kind of law will work because then the enterprises are ready to invest. But a trial means that you also test. And as a scientist, I would then say, take the disadvantages and the risks, the supposed risks, very serious and have a accompanying research and be ready also to withdraw and try other things out. If I can add upon that, one should remind what is one origin, actually, one political or strategic origin of this whole approach of due diligence. 
even if there are unintended risk and even if there are issues on deficits on implementation. The other approach is to have the state as being responsible and not the company. And that exists as well. Of course, we have trade agreements. There, the partner state, like, for instance, thinking about the EU-Mercosur agreement recently, nearly finalized, negotiated, still not adopted or ratified. And there, the partner side, so the Mercosur states, would be the responsible ones to fulfill certain sustainable development chapters in this agreement. And critical voices say that is the better way because anyhow, such essential issues like human rights should not be just thrown to private actors and companies responsible for that. That is really an original state and public task. But now there comes the but. This is not so easy to be enforced. Thinking about a sovereign trade partner, sovereign state, what are you going to do if the state is simply not fulfilling these requirements? How could you enforce it? And that's easier to be enforced via the companies in your own territory because you can force them. You can really do a legal act and then throughout the value chain up to the delivery region that will be fulfilled. So that is one of the strategic thinking use this type of key entry points to support the fulfillment of human rights if it's more difficult to do that within trade agreements, for instance, with a sovereign trade partner. Germany has passed such a law. The European law is in the making. Um, you touched it already, Michael. What should be changed so that the negative effects you have mentioned do not happen as you have painted them? We know already from smaller labels, from voluntary standards, that very often a higher quality in processes and in products are accompanied by training, research and technology development, input subsidies, strengthening of the value chain by either enterprises, but also by, for example, very strongly development cooperation. So that should be certainly a accompanying measure in such trials uh, that you have the rules but that you also accompany not only the companies, the whole value chains, all the actors. It is multi-stakeholder approach, which is needed here to help them implement these requirements and care that these dropout effects do not happen, so that the poorest are included and not excluded. Michelle, you also asked Belinda Edmonds from the African Cotton Foundation to send us her expectations. Let's have a listen. We need to provide culturally sensitive training on our human rights expectations and the provision of practical solutions. For example, improving the accessibility to and affordability of education for rural children has been shown to significantly reduce child labour. A real value must be placed on environmentally sustainable production, including the potential carbon sequestration opportunities. and. We must ensure a trade-related level playing field and fair, consistent application of penalties for non-conformance. It sounds a little bit like Belinda is calling for more Western support for small farmers, right? Exactly. That is her conclusion. And not to rely on regulations without support. And I think that is really the key. We cannot accept, let's say, no, we can, of course, we can accept the risk and we do it, but we shouldn't do it. So that means, for example, that we should really invest more directly into companies and accompany private enterprises in creating these better conditions. We do it already for some, for example, for small companies, for fair trade, for special niche products, but we very rarely do it for larger value chains. In these cases, we often explicitly exclude any profit or support for the company in its core business activities. And that, of course, is not what Belinda is asking for. She asks directly intervene into the value chains and try to bring these partners better together. And for example, if she asks for support in children education, no? that is, uh, means, for example, we should also take in, into account that these countries are not industrialized countries and children are supposed to work on the farms. What is important is that in the end, they have a better education in these kind of producer families than in non-producer families. So again, a much better harmonization 
of trade regulations and development support. And that may fit to an anyhow new strategy of the EU on trade policy. Um, the EU developed a new uh, trade policy strategy just in February. And there's one huge new objective to support enforcement. And they have, again, two new measures how to do that. And one is together with the local actors to find out where are the hindering factors to make sure that sustainable development chapters in trade agreements could be perfectly enforced in this country. So this is a bit of a not so lucky term, how they name that, which is called Handbook of Implementation. And the first one is now developed for the EU-Ecuador trade agreement. And there they really discuss with the local local actors in Ecuador. So that's something one could use. Another issue is they have a new complaint platform where states and companies and any natural person and uh, NGOs, if they face a certain non-fulfillment of human rights environmental legislation in another country, they can complain there. But that is not ending there, then there will be a kind of investigation. Okay, what is the reason for that? So these issues may support the enforcement, actually. Mm -hmm. So is this what you were mentioning beforehand, calling it the concept of a smart mix of the instruments? Yes, if one combines... In this example, the use of local expertise regarding trade agreements and use them as well, of course, regarding due diligence acts. But there are some more measures one could use. And there are these trade agreements to improve the enforcement of the chapters on sustainable development. There's another issue. The EU is offering kind of tariff preferences, meaning lower tariffs for imports coming from developing countries, and especially if they fulfill human rights and environmental legislation, you can put it the other way around. Once they are not fulfilling these requirements, you can again increase tariffs. For instance, this is a kind of measure. Another often forgotten instrument would be bilateral investment agreements. There, companies can complain against the country where they do an investment already for compensation in case there's expropriation. And what does expropriation mean? It's not only the very simple idea to take away land from the ownership, but for instance, to make domestic legislation stronger, for instance, on sustainability objectives. So then in principle, a company can complain, oh, that's more expensive now for me and it has been changed compared to the date when I decided to do my investment here. That's expropriation. You have to compensate me. What I wanted to say as a result, this type of agreements may undermine all the other <laughs> frames we use to support sustainable development. So one could think about to make a better use of these agreements However, the EU is a bit sensible about that because exactly this type of investment rules were very problematic in the recent past in some agreements like TTIP with the US or CETA with Canada. So I get your point. You say not to rely too much on due diligence, also take into account everything that has been also established so far. We talk now a lot about the unintended consequences of due diligence laws. Again, looking at experience, can we draw some implications or effects of due diligence laws already from history? The existing, this new generation of supply chain laws is very recent, so we don't have much evidence on it. And unfortunately, it is not foreseen that there is a real systematic monitoring review of it. What we know from economics, for example, very good is that high standards are always favoring the large players and disfavoring the small players and the informal ones. So that is relatively well assured observation, both in our own economies and across the world. By the way, that is the reason why most developing countries for up to now have refused to have, for example, social and ecological regulations. If you impose 
extremely high laws that means that we keep all the labor within the own country and that is exactly something which is also happening these laws are a playing field for lobbyists they are very much trying to influence these laws because they know higher we put on the barriers for external players and deliverers better it is for our own labor conditions for our labor laws for our labor markets for our enterprises and so on. And that is another area which we should really have a good look at. Following your argumentation, I mean, you say the higher the standards, the better for the companies. But why was it that... Uh, for the large companies. For the large companies. But why was it that actually from the company side, there was a lot of lobbying against these laws, actually, as far as I read from the media? It was both. It was both that 20% from German companies already applied the voluntary standards. And that were the 20% which were very much lobbying in favor of a legal act. Why? I mean, maybe because of sustainability reasons, but as well because of own competitiveness reasons, because they feared if we are the only ones fulfilling these high standards, which is maybe nice and the consumers will go for that. However, then there are 80% which are not fulfilling it and they gain a competitiveness effect. So you find both. So I would support the argument of Michael there. So let's look forward. I think we all agree that supply chains should be more sustainable in an ecological sense and in a social sense. You both argue that due diligence laws are not the ideal solution. Bettina, you also said it's a mix of many, many different mechanisms is needed. The orchestra needs a lot of instruments. That's what you said. But now, if we look at an ideal world, how would such an agreement look like? What do you think, Bettina? That's difficult because there is never an <laughs> ideal world. But I try. Um, I mean, a perfect world would mean the W2O level is the level. Why? It's a multilateral level which can avoid these international leakage effects. If we have a joint understanding of what are the standard level we all want to achieve, then you could impose based on this consensus a kind of trade barrier related to that. Another perfect bit would be to use better and more modern investment agreements. And we already said that to have a partner style dialogue to understand really the local effects and the local hindering uh, factors. And maybe as a final word, to think about as well, not only in one direction, due diligence approaches assume a certain kind of trade direction. And that's always the flow from a delivery region like a developing countries to us. And the processing and all the value-added thing is then done here, which is maybe not a sustainable way because on the other side, we always try to target to gain more added value in developing countries. And in the future, maybe middle-income countries or now developing countries may import from us and process our products. And how are we fulfilling actually all these environmental and human rights obligations? So changing perspectives, uh, Michael, the ideal solutions from a rather local point of view, what would it be? I just want to reiterate um, These laws are there because we are not living in a perfect world, unfortunately, <laughs> because if not, they, this law wouldn't be necessary. I think we can first increase our support to smallholder farmers and to rural development more generally, because many of these smallholder farmers shouldn't stay smallholder farmers. They should have the opportunity to step out, uh, do something else and let other farmers grow like it has also happened in Europe. The second one, and I have already briefly mentioned, it, I think we should open our development cooperation to a broader public-private partnership idea where we accept that if we support, for example, a certain value chain, of course, it will also profit private enterprises. But what is even more important, we haven't talked about local value chains, and most smallholder farmers in the world are supplying their own countries and their own consumers, and they also need support. And these value chains will, for a long time being, will not be as, let's say, high-level regulated like our ones, 
but they can, of course, be improved within the possibilities of the local markets of consumer willingness and ability to pay for food. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Bettina Rudloff from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs for this discussion. Thank you for being here, Bettina. Welcome. It was a pleasure. And Michael Brüntrup from the German Development Institute. Thank you very much for joining us today, Michael. Yeah, thank you for the um, interview. The podcast is brought to you by the research network Sustainable Global Supply Chains, which brings together leading researchers from around the globe. I'm Nicholas Martin. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe and stay tuned for our next episode.